In the fall of 1984, almost 40 years ago, the BBC aired the spookiest movie I've ever seen. The Sheffield-based drama Threads follows two typical families as they experience the terror of a third world war. The radios in the background provide information about the escalating tension, the start of hostilities in Iran, and the terrifying steps towards a full-scale battle between the West and the Soviet Union while they are preoccupied with their own internal tragedies. Then the true terror strikes. One early morning, the city is alerted by air raid sirens. We witness commuters and shoppers scrambling for shelter, kids crying, and adults yelling in fear. Sheffield loses all power when a Soviet bomb detonates over the North Sea. The sky turns a brilliant, deadly white, and a massive mushroom cloud appears on the horizon. A woman is seen on the street with a horrified expression on her face and a pool of pea growing at her feet. The scene is horrifying beyond belief, but it's only the beginning. What comes next is far worse, as many readers who are older will recall. Law and order totally disintegrates as fires rage throughout the towns of Britain. Approximately 30 million individuals have already passed away and millions more will do so in the upcoming weeks due to radiation exposure, sickness, and famine. There is no sunshine for a year. Britain becomes hungry without crops. Less than 10 million people remain, and civilization descends to that of the Middle Ages, with the survivors fighting a vicious battle against hunger and darkness. The English language deteriorates into a fractured argo as time goes on. And at the chilling conclusion, we understand that because all new newborns are born with horrifying abnormalities, the destiny of mankind itself is in jeopardy. Even though Threads was fiction, it was an extraordinarily well-documented form of fiction. The creators spoke with medical professionals, scientists, military experts, and historians of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear attacks, and the narrator frequently backs up what we are witnessing with facts and data. We now know that the government of Margaret Thatcher's specialists concurred with them. According to released papers, Whitehall War exercises in the 1970s and 1980s simulated a nuclear war in which tens of millions of people would perish and British society would be irrevocably altered. Of course, it's tempting to believe that this is all history. Many of us put nuclear fears in our mental attics when the Cold War ended and dismissed movies like Threads as artefacts of the past. However, the government earlier this month published its most recent National Risk Register, an annual analysis of the biggest dangers to our national security. And even though I don't worry much, I found the reading to be unsettling. As usual, the paper outlines a wide range of potential threats, including a new pandemic in the vein of COVID and cyber attacks on the banking system. But the idea of a significant strike using chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, with a probability of between 1 and 5%, really caught my attention. Although we typically associate nuclear anxiety with the Cold War, the prospect of an atomic Armageddon still exists today because of how hazardous the world continues to be. 
along with Israel, which has never formally acknowledged possessing nuclear weapons. Two additional nations, North Korea and Pakistan, have entered the nuclear club in the decades after the fall of the Berlin Wall, joining the United States, Russia, China, Britain, France, and India. In fact, according to researchers at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, these nine nuclear-armed states currently possess 12,512 warheads, which would be more than enough to wipe out civilization once. Most of us in Britain used to comfort ourselves with the notion that a big nuclear war was completely improbable. But everything has altered because of the Ukraine conflict. Since Vladimir Putin's disastrous invasion, his little army of TV propagandists has shouted ominous nuclear threats at the West almost every week. They have specifically targeted Britain over and over again. For instance, a former Russian general begged Putin to use his underwater Poseidon missile on our beaches in one particularly deranged tirade a few months back, causing a 1,000-foot radioactive tsunami that would mean Great Britain would no longer exist. Of course, it's simple to write this off as meaningless rhetoric from a dying administration. For my part, I have little patience for the weak appeasers who would willingly hand up large portions of Ukrainian land to Putin out of fear of his nuclear blackmail. Nevertheless, should we ignore these nuclear dangers entirely? After all, the former Russian president and current vice chairman of the Kremlin's National Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, is one of the most ardent proponents of nuclear war. Medvedev has changed himself into the most aggressive hawk ever, remaining slavishly obedient to his dictatorial master. He has repeatedly called for the deployment of nuclear weapons against various targets, including the entire country of Poland and The Hague, the Dutch city where the International Criminal Court has accused Putin of war crimes. Just two weeks prior, Medvedev once again threatened to use a nuclear bomb if the Ukrainian counteroffensive was successful in liberating further land. Once more, it's easy to write this off as empty rhetoric from a Kremlin courtier. It's difficult to understand how utilizing nuclear weapons would assist the Russian state, as several military specialists have noted. It would be foolish for Russia to launch a nuclear missile attack on Kiev since it would almost surely result in a massive Western involvement and make Russia a pariah for years. Since the Ukrainians have never focused their troops on a single target, employing a so-called tactical nuclear bomb on the battlefield would also likely be counterproductive and the fallout would undoubtedly impact hundreds of Russian soldiers. But does that imply that it will never occur? For sure not. Humans don't always act in sensible ways, as history has shown. If they had, Russia would not have first attacked Ukraine. Politicians and commentators who frequently talk about deploying nuclear weapons normalize the habit. Consider yourself a regular Russian who must endure night after night of Kremlin propaganda. Could you possibly start to think that launching a missile at Warsaw or Kiev is the only way to move forward? Or picture yourself as a savvy Russian politician courting a fervently nationalist electorate. 
Would you be inclined to keep threatening to use the nuclear option, even if it were only rhetorically, until you were compelled to do it in order to avoid appearing timid and weak? And much of what we want to tell ourselves doesn't happen, history says it may. The world has previously seen two completely catastrophic nuclear attacks. The American bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the summer of 1945, which resulted in the deaths of almost 200,000 civilians. This was recently brought to our attention by the blockbuster movie Oppenheimer. Harry Truman, the President of the United States, who gave the orders for those assaults, wasn't crazy, evil, or even very warlike. Far from it. Truman, a moderate centre-left man who prided himself on his commonplaceness and decency, believed it was the proper thing to do, was a former haberdasher. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the physicist who oversaw the U.S. Nuclear program, concurred. Oppenheimer initially believed that the atomic bomb would be a tool to end all hostilities. He later altered his mind, however, as the nuclear arms race intensified, being paralyzed by the worry that it would spell the end of life as we know it. Was his anxiety unwarranted? According to history, no. The world came dangerously near to another nuclear conflict during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, which occurred over 20 years later. According to release documents, Fidel Castro aggressively lobbied Nikita Khrushchev of the USSR to launch a nuclear weapon if American forces invaded his island nation however harsh and terrible the consequences would be. The knowledge that some of President John F. Kennedy's military advisers aggressively pushed him to attack Cuba despite the obvious danger of nuclear war is even more alarming. Once more, they weren't crazy or evil. They were wise, experienced, and well-travelled individuals who found themselves imprisoned by the callous logic of their own foreign policy. Naturally, there was never a nuclear war since the Russians gave up and took their missiles out of the Caribbean island. However, it may have, and it would take a very arrogant person to think that it couldn't happen again in the future. Given this context, it seems amazing that we give nuclear danger such little thought. For instance, I remember reading dystopian Cold War fantasies about sad ten-year-olds battling for life in the radioactive ruins of a post-apocalyptic Wolverhampton when I was a youngster in the 1970s and 1980s. This was also the height of the campaign for nuclear disarmament, as many readers will recall, when thousands of people regularly marched in opposition to Britain's participation in the nuclear weapons race. It was also the height of the notorious Protect and Survive public awareness program, which consisted of a series of brief TV films instructing people on how to survive a nuclear assault. These videos were created in the middle of the 1970s for distribution in the run-up to the next global war. The Protect and Survive films are still incredibly depressing to see. The narrator advises moving the body to another room in the home if someone passes away while you are in your fallout room. But what if the scent emanates from Great Aunt Audrey's decomposing body? The narrator adds calmly, 
You should bury the body for the time being in a trench or cover it with earth and mark the spot of the burial. Early in the 1980s, the Protect and Survive campaign was leaked, sparking a wave of anti nuclear protest. Therefore, it is not surprising that the government has not launched a comparable plan now. And it is easy for me to see why nuclear danger is rarely in the news. After all, we already have a lot on our minds, from the everyday realities of the cost of living crisis to existential dangers like pandemics and climate change. But I think we're deluding ourselves if we think a nuclear war is unavoidable. People used to say the same thing about the systematic killing of men, women, and children in industrial death camps, but now we know that the Holocaust actually took place, and that it was committed by highly intelligent individuals in one of the richest and most developed societies on the planet. Humans have a propensity to lash out, react erratically, gamble stupidly, or just make life-altering errors, which is something that anybody who has studied history can attest to. And although I hope the horrible time is put off till after my children and grandkids have passed away, I wouldn't be at all shocked if it never does. Every man, woman, and child lives beneath a nuclear sword of Damocles, dangling by the thinnest of threads, capable of being severed at any time by accident, miscalculation, or madness, John F. Kennedy spoke to the United Nations in September 1961. Almost precisely one year before the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy made those remarks. At that particular moment, the world was saved by caution and sound judgment, including his own. But will we ever be that fortunate? And how certain are we that a world leader won't hit the button one day, motivated by hatred, wrath, or just plain fear? I wish I could say the answer is yes. But I worry that history and human nature actually paint a much grimmer picture.